so it didn't cost much, and it was simply used to, to sustain your family. Instead of the fancy patch box that we have upstairs, which you press a button and the patch box opens, mm -hmm. this simply was a hole he filled with hog grease. Yeah. And it had no inlays. It has a little bit of curly maple, but it's not the premium piece that you find on a beautiful piece of furniture. It has just the basics. This one is about 36 caliber. And I would say that it would be very dangerous out to 100 yards. And, uh, and certainly on a good day, a fair wind and a good friend, you could probably hit something at 200 yards. They're not 400 yard weapons. One of the reasons for making barrels long on the early guns was because the gunpowder wasn't any good? No. Because the farther apart your sights are, the more definitive the target is, the very slightest movement is easily seen. It's been proven that guns can be that long and shoot just as well as one this long, but not as hard and uh, not as accurate if you're using open sights. So with open sights, the, and the other thing you'll notice too, uh, you know what presbyopia is, it's when you're 40 years old and all of a sudden you need reading glasses. But what happens if you put this sight back here, it's fuzzy. So they moved it quite a ways up here for the guy that could afford this, and, and it, it still, to me, uh, forms a, a very clear image. Um, I'm going to operate this a little bit, knowing if I break it, I can fix it. <laughs> <laughs> and this one it has a set trigger, so you set the rear trigger, you see the front trigger jump. Now you go back and it's cocked. Powder is put in the pan, and now you're very careful because it only takes, and I'm not going to, I'm going to open the pan so there's no spark. It only takes the touch of a finger, just the breath, a feather touching, could set it off. You can adjust it with a screw. So even though this is a very simple one, they had the advantage of a very long sight radius. They had the advantage of a trigger that is as good as any target trigger you can get today. And you just touch it and it goes off. Momentary delay on flintlocks, um, but the weight and the mass of them meant that they didn't move much in that time that they went off. So a little explanation of a very basic Kentucky rifle. I don't know if anybody wants to look. Hand it around if anyone wants to see it. Yeah, we can. We can. We're manufactured in Pennsylvania. Most no, it's um, it, probably uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, mm -hmm. Virginia. And, what I didn't say about Kentucky Rifles is that as soon as they had them and they were famous and everybody had to have one and they made them everywhere. And they, so the first ones are called classic Kentuckys. They were made in Pennsylvania. But as they go along, they start to be made in many other places. Um, the fittings or furniture, which is this, the butt plate, the lower thimbles, the upper thimbles, these things could be purchased from providers who might have had them made either in Philadelphia or England. Some of the locks are English marked. They were made in, in uh, London. Or, and they just made barrels of them and sent them over here, and these guys would buy them. And yet there are some men who were gunsmiths, like in Bedford County, who made the entire thing. They made the lock, they made every screw, they made every piece. Because they were remote, they couldn't get a hold of this material. And they even made the barrels themselves. So there's everything from, you won't call it a kit gun, but everything from being able to buy every part of it, or most every part, and provide the stock. I have to think that it would take someone about three weeks to make this, uh, if he was very efficient. Some of the other ones probably took a month. They were pretty expensive in their time. But once you had one, it, once you broke it, it, it just, uh, so something that the family would have for probably for 100 years. And still be good. Was a mold used to make the barrel? No, the barrel um, is, in the earlier times, was made out of a flat piece of steel that was rolled over on its edges and welded together, and then hammered with a, uh, an, insert, an insert inside, a mandrel. And that closed the well. And there is, on many of them, you can see the little kind of a well. They bored them out. It was a very laborious process, and they rifled them, which means they put grooves in it that made the ball <coughs> like, a, like a gyroscope. 
So the barrel was a very tedious thing to make. These parts aren't made by just hammering them out or drop forging them or casting them. They have to be filed. So it's very tedious. Things like this, brass, easily cast, and they cast those. These are made out of sheet brass. And I, I have actually made a number of them myself. Um, I, think, I think we have one here somewhere. We'll maybe find it. These are, uh, this is the, uh, this is the brown bess. Um, this is the English uh, issue, land, uh, land troop issue, firearm for the Revolutionary War all the way up to the War of 1812, 75 caliber. All you have to do is put the powder down there, and put a paper, cock, you know, paper, piece of, piece of paper with the ball on it, and uh, <coughs> charges, and you, do, you don't have to ram it, you don't have to compress the patch or anything like that. And they worked very well, and they were probably only good for, I don't think you could hit a man for sure beyond 50 yards, and you probably couldn't hit him because they really didn't do much for sighting. So what they did is they all lined up very regimented and um, very disciplined, as you've seen in the movies, and they all fired at once, big volley fire, and somewhere out there, anybody in the way um, would, would all would like a solid ball, or would they always use buckshot or anything like that? It, I, I believe that, um, I think lots of the militia did and lots of the uh, irregulars, and, but it was considered a little, a little cheating. So they did, and it also <laughs> was complicated too, because you could, did you put two in or did you put one in or did you put a handful in? <laughs> when you have a ball in your hand, you just put it in and you know it's, you know it's there. Um, and, and so these were the mainstay of the British Army and they had a very proud uh, military tradition of, of using these with tremendous discipline. Nobody was allowed to sort of snipe or, you know, you, you, you fired when you were commanded to fire and you did it all with the rest of your rank dropped down on their knees and loaded the guns and the guys behind you fired over their heads. And they did that repetitively. So it was, uh, it was a different kind of warfare. When they got over here, they had woods warfare. And there was there were no there weren't many open fields, and if there were, they sure avoided them. And that is to say that the Patriots did. Those are smooth bore, right? Those are all smooth bore. Most of them, uh, the brown vest is uh, 75 caliber. Uh, our uh, this is a this is a Charleville. This is a musket also used in the civil in the Revolutionary War, and it was French made, but. We liked it so much that we made our own, and then some of our first muskets, the model 1795, was sort of patterned on the French Charleville musket. Uh, both of these are uh, 75 caliber. And then as we get along to the War of 1812, this one is uh, a Harper's Ferry, dated 1813. Um, they started reducing the caliber to around 69. They didn't feel it had to be that much. Not a lot's changed. Um, they started reinforcing the hammer because they found that in the middle of the battle, sometimes they'd break off there. So they would put a loop underneath just to reinforce it. Um, flint uh, had to be renewed all the time. Uh, you could probably fire about five shots and you would want to tap the edge of the flint to sharpen it. It would nap it. Um, so that's kind of where we are right up to that point. Um, we had some western expansion during this time, and settlers would take old muskets, old fowling pieces, and Kentucky rifles, and go west. And as they settled in uh, and dealt with the Plains Indians, some aspects of these firearms became um, obsolete or, or, or just not useful. And um, one of the things is the range. Um, antelope and prairie things, they, they, they want to be off three or 400 yards. They won't even come close. So they had to build larger ones. When they got down into uh, Texas, they were dealing with the Comanche uh, tribes down there and they were having quite a, quite a problem. They were actually losing pretty badly. 
and they were losing a lot of people, and of course they thought they had the right to be there, and of course the Indians didn't like that too much. So the Indian tactic would be to do what? I mean, you'd probably have a war club, you'd probably have a bow and arrow, you'd probably have a musket, you'd be on horseback, one of the best riders in the world, and you would go up and you would draw the fire of one of these guys or three of these guys with this, and while they reloaded, you would charge them, and of course, if they were on horseback, the settlers, they had to dismount to load this gun. And as soon as you did, they went right in and they got you with a war club or an arrow or a lance or a gun. And so it was a tactic they were just superb at, and uh, there wasn't much, much they could do about it. So when the state of Texas became independent, they decided to have a navy. This is a kind of a convoluted story. And you know, all, everybody knows the story of Sam Cole. He had a dream. He went, to, he went to India. I think he saw a revolving flintlock revolver over there. He saw some portions of the uh, winch on a ship, and he decided that he could make some kind of a revolver. And so rapid fire, or repeat fire, became important because you wanted to be able to, so that's why many of the horsemen would have three guns, mm -hmm. six guns. They'd stick them in their belts wherever they could, but get kind of, they would like to have something like that. So <coughs> Colt kind of developed that uh, through a series of handmade pieces which were made by a gunsmith in Philadelphia named Pearson. He then formed a company uh, called the, Patterson, the Colt Patterson Firearm Company in Patterson, New Jersey with a partner. It failed, but before it failed, he produced a number of these guns which went out and they were bought by the, Tex the state of Texas for their Navy. This is called a Texas Pattern Patterson, or Texas Patterson. When this became successful, Colt was out of business. These didn't sell, but they had them in storage and then they reissued them to Jack Hayes and many of the Texas Rangers that they call down there for Indian fighters. And they found these to be very useful. They would trick the Indians. They didn't know they had them. And they would, he said, close with them, powder burn them. In other words, go right up to them. And they would think, oh boy, I got you with the, with the war club now. And they'd pull these out and, and use them. And uh, the Indians used the expression, he had a gun on every finger. <laughs> Five, and five shots. Ah. They could count. <laughs> so these became uh, really desirable and really underst you understand that you'd want to have them. And they had two holsters on the horse, and they'd have two of them. And that kind of morphed into the, the uh, Mexican War. <clears throat> so there were very few of these. They were breaking. They were very, uh, they were very delicate. When you cock the gun, which I'm not going to do, the trigger springs out of the bottom. It's as thin and as fine as you can imagine, and they're pretty much handmade. Um, there were patterns, but they had not a lot of machinery used in making them. So they took a lot of time, and they cost a lot of money, and they broke a lot, and they weren't interchangeable. The parts wouldn't, uh, wouldn't fit with one another. You couldn't take your buddy's cylinder and put it on your broken <coughs> gun or anything like that. So. Uh, when the Mexican War came out, Hayes, John Coffee Hayes, and of course Captain Walker um, went to New York to uh, get some firearms. Show some around. Yeah, that's a very Just interesting gun and a, and a very <coughs> and a very rare gun, by the way. Yeah. <coughs> that's one of the most sought-after collector firearms there are. Patterson, uh, Texas model Patterson, 34 caliber, five shots, not that good, but a heck of a lot better than a war club. Mm -hmm. and Less like, than a thousand manufacturers? Um, they made a, a, I don't think a thousand. And uh, they made uh, all numbers of them from a time, they called it Baby Patterson, which was only that big. They had the number two, that's called the number five, that was the largest, two, three, and four. And they went just like this, uh, Baby Patterson, Pocket Patterson, uh, belt, pa uh, belt Patterson, 
and then holster pads. And they, so they called him by all those names, Patterson. Uh, that was his marketing. Uh, <coughs> but he went out of business and was bankrupt. And so Hayes, who had used these successfully against the Indians, uh, warfare, and Captain Walker went to New York and found, dug him up, found Sam Colt. And they said, hey, we want these firearms. And Sam Colt partnered with Eli Whitney. And together with Walker and Eli mm -hmm. Whitney, they built one of the largest handguns ever made, the Walker Colt. And it's that big. And it's very powerful. And it had all the improvements that they wanted. And it started, and it was bought by the Army, and it started the dynasty of Colt Firearms Manufacturing Company, which sold firearms of one nature or another continually to the Army until World War II, from, from say, 1847. So they always had a new model. They were constantly working. And that's why they got to be such a big name. Some of the things that they made were really not that good. This is, is just as difficult <coughs> to operate and just as fussy as that very small as that revolver. And it had the wonderful, this is called a ring trigger Patterson carbine. It had the wonderful possibility, these of course are fired for percussion, of having a chain fire event where every single cartridge in the thing went off. And so there were guys in these, some of these were issued. There were guys that just, it, it wasn't popular with the army folks. <laughs> and so, um, and, and, and so this, this just didn't make it. It wasn't even an attempt to rebirth this. This is a Patterson, made along the but there was no attempt to try to do this because of the um, stigma of, of uh, this chain fire. And it, it happened because <coughs> the early percussion ignition system was a little dangerous and a little less uh, controlled and uh, uh, lacked uniformity, I guess we'll say. So that's a Patterson ring trigger, also very rare. And they did things to these, uh, like for instance, um, there were improvements made. That one has a loading lever, so it has a, a ram to push the, the ball and the powder right into the cylinder. Um, and I think, uh, well, what year did, the, did Cole Patterson go out of business? Uh, well, just about the year that they started. That was, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, what they did is they, uh, they made a bunch of guns, and they didn't start <coughs> fast enough. And he had a partner named Ehlers, E-H-L-E-R-S. And Ehlers said, where's the money? And Cole didn't have it. And so they closed the factory, and they had a number of these firearms made, but they were kind of all in stores. They continued to sell them. And then Ehlers, uh, in liquidating the company and trying to get his money back, continued to put pieces together. And so they might have sold them to maybe maybe 1840, but I don't think so. They started in 1837. So it was 1837 and 38 and 39, they were gone. And so in 47 is when Walker and Hayes looked up Sam Colt he was around trying to do other things like submarine cables across the Atlantic. He was an entrepreneur. They <coughs> looked him up and they asked him to, to revive the Mexican War. That is complicated. Yeah. You don't want to be all fingers with that. And I don't think you can load another run either. <laughs> Yeah, okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. My left arm is about to get up. So Colt started a dynasty with that, and everybody else wanted to get into the idea of making a repeating arm. So I have an interesting one here. This is called a volcanic pistol made by the New Haven Arms Company. It's pretty interesting. This one, of course, had a cylinder in which you so this is one of the first self-contained cartridges. Uh, this is about 1855. And they took the ball, or projectile, that went in here, that loaded inside this magazine under the barrel. 
And the ball was, there was no cartridge, there was no paper. The ball was hollow and had gunpowder in it. And at the very back of it, they had a piece of cork. You can imagine how powerful this was, it was not that big. And the cork had some fulminating mercury, which is percussion cap. And this had a pin that came out and went through the cork inside the bullet. And uh, it didn't work too good. And um, I think it would bounce off a green log, honestly. <laughs> it just wasn't very powerful. But notice, I'm going to work this. Notice the action on it, if, if, you, if you can. As I move this little tiny lever, cocks the hammer, opens the breech, takes one of the cartridges which are being pushed by this spring-loaded thing, lifts it up in what's called the elevator, and puts it in. It didn't really work very well. And as I said, it probably would only make a man very angry if he was hit with it. Uh, rather than actually, you know, it just, it, it just did, but it's a beautiful thing. It's beautifully made, it's attractive, and it evolved from a gun called the Jennings. Jennings patented it. He called it the Jennings Rocket Ball. And then Smith and Wesson, who you've probably heard of, Smith and Wesson made one. All of these were different shape. Then they made this one. Then this one, the volcanic, we made an arms company. Yep. Sort of a, this is this is very uh, actually a very neat looking thing. That's the fundamental beginning of all Winchester firearms. So it evolved through those ways. And that lever and the toggle action breech mechanics inside and the magazine under the barrel first became a Henry rifle in World War in uh, the Civil War then became something I have on the table and then it became the lever action of Winchesters that every farmer has for deer hunting all the way to they're still making them today or, or their likes but they are a repeating firearm they're not really that important for hunting. I mean, other people say, oh, i got to have a magazine full of cartridges. Good luck. Um, but they were very popular in the West um, because of altercations, because of uh, just you had to have one that shot more than once. And we have a, a gun that we'll bring up next. And you'll kind of see it has a brass receiver, but you'll see the same elements in it as that gun that uh, that pistol came along earlier. AJ? Hey, uh, those, um, they didn't have much, like lathes or stuff back then, so how did they make them? They had lathes and they, they had, they had, they had, um, they had uh, milling machines. And as a matter of fact, so cool. mm -hmm. this company here, Sharps, mm -hmm. the Springfield Arsenal in 1850, would make a gun with finer tolerances that are made today. Every single part was interchangeable, and it fit within a thousandth of an inch. And I say this as a mechanic who's taken many pieces from many different things. It is amazing what they did. And uh, they did it all with patterns, jigs, and dies. In other words, they, they measured it, but they, somebody made a master pattern, and they handed this work off to unskilled workers, uh, relatively unskilled. I mean, they became skilled. Uh, but boys off the street would run a drill press, but the drill would go through a hardened piece of steel which held the part. They didn't have to think about it, they just had to do it right. And they worked out an entire system. And that system is a kind of a separate story than this, but this, this gun that you asked, because it's so precision, benefited from that system, the system of jigs, dies, and templates. And it was uh, first uh, introduced by our arm system, so uh, John Hall, in Harper's Ferry, made the first interchangeable object, manufactured object. And he proved it, and it was an act of Congress, or that is a congressional committee went down to Harper's Ferry, and he had arsenals from uh, Middleton, Connecticut, uh, his arsenal in Harper's Ferry, and several others, all of whom made the same gun. And he said, send me the parts. And they send the guns down from three arsenals, they took them entirely apart, mixed them all up, threw them on the floor, and had a common guy put it together. And this congressional committee said, we certify that interchangeability has been achieved, that our every single part is the same. 
That interestingly went into all gun manufacturing, of course. It went into Terry Clocks. Then it went to McCormick Harvesters. It went into almost every manufactured thing that you could think of from about 1850 to Henry Ford, who said, I invented it. And as Jennifer said, he looked at a meat, a meat packing house disassembly line with carcasses going along being taken apart. And he said, if I make them interchangeable, and I have guys walk along beside the thing putting a car together, I've invented it. So anyway, it's a pretty interesting uh, system of the fact of interchangeability, how to achieve it. And in the very early days, it was very difficult. Today, you just, you know, you have a, a finger uh, operable uh, pad or a milling machine, and you can put all the, the data into it you want. But it all came from that. Uh, and it came from the arms industry. And all of these firearms from kind of the one I showed you, <coughs> not this one, not the Patterson. Everyone from Colts, Walker, through all of these, uh, benefited from that. So now we have a different kind of thing. These are craft made. These are made by somebody with a file. And he looks down the side and says it's straight or it's not straight. It's all human judgment, which is why I like them. Um, I like these too, but uh, this, this really shows a part of a person into it when they are made. Um, the military uh, armories. Not so much because they broke up the, the work, and there were people who were lock makers, people who were stock makers. But the people who made the indigenous Kentucky rifles that we're talking about did it all themselves, and it was their idea of it. That's the way it should be. And they were very individualistic. So Colt uh, went on to become very successful. Civil War helped him tremendously, helped all of these gun manufacturers. The lever action repeaters became very important. The Sharps uh, long range rifles became important, the Sharps carbines and the Sharps rifles, and the Spencer, uh, which I'll get to all show you all those. But this is a very nice product, which I won't have to say a lot about, except I know one or two of you have one. Um, this is a, I call it 62, uh, well, it could be 61 Navy or 62 Navy. Percussion revolver, made during the Civil War, undoubtedly. 30,000. And it's uh, beautifully engraved, and it has hints of uh, gold wash on the cylinder. It was quite a quite an ornate thing. It had ivory grips. And it may have had somebody's name on the back strap, but it's a little bit obliterated. It may have been presented to somebody. Um, but it shows what happens in manufacturing. When everybody's bought every gun they need, and everybody's got a gun for their purpose, and then they go, but do you have a gun with ivory grips? <laughs> <laughs> and is it engraved? So what happens with cars today, right? Is a touch screen? Is it big touch screen? Uh, you know, it, this is a way of, so when you see this type of material on firearms, you can kind of guess that they're having slow years. And they're starting to add fins on the back of the trunk. They're starting to put crazy lights. And uh, this is, <coughs> but these are very beautiful in their own little art form. And uh, this is the discipline that I started out in the business uh, doing uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it was engraving. Uh, and uh, we learned how to engrave uh, as this is done with a hammer and chisel. Uh, and uh, that's the way we didn't use electric machines. But anyway, this is Colt Navy. Uh, and it's New York engraved is one of the one of the folks at the astutely said, um, it is not from the factory, it was uh, embellished after the factory. And that would have suited Wild Bill Hickok just fine. He would have just thought that was perfect, <coughs> right in that era. And who knows where that went, and who, who, who just, it's just amazing. A lot of these things were uh, used as presentation pieces too, but Colt, when he ran out of customers, he started adding things to the guns. And that's, uh, he also was one of the first people who used um, a nationwide advertising. He was a, a marketing quiz. He used broadsides, one of the first people to, to manufacture an item, and then put broadsides in every paper all over the country. And you got to have a Colt firearm. And uh, of course, every other manufacturer followed it. And, uh, but his, 
his and Oliver Winchester's modes of advertising firearms are still studied today as a business, uh, the, the root of a business uh, method. And then there's the telemarketers. <laughs> he would have been a telemarketer for his day, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that you did when you sold all the guns that you could sell you would try to deal to another market and the European market hadn't been tapped so Colt first went over to the Crystal Palace 1851, I think it was the Crystal Palace exposition, and he had huge displays of all of his firearms and all of his manufacturing techniques. And he went around and he lectured about how he, he invented interchangeability <laughs> and how he had spirit. So he thought that he would open, he would try to sell his guns abroad, but guess what? The English have a thing called a proof system, and no gun may be sold in England without being proved. That is sent to a proof house, and a big charge of gunpowder put in it, bigger than anybody would ever do, fired, and if it didn't blow up, then they put a small mark on it. And of course, the amount of powder and everything was very regulated, I just say that, as large. So this was pretty impractical, you know, like he didn't <coughs> want to send a gun over and have the English go, it blew up. No good. So he decided to manufacture in England. So he started manufacturing, and this is called a London Colt. He started manufacturing them, and by having his manufacturing there, he got the okay, sort of, from the proof house to not blow up his guns, and thereby, you know, in other words, they didn't want competition. And so by having employing English makers and workmen, in his, it didn't last long. He didn't sell many guns, but they are among the nice, nicest finished firearms that he made because the London uh, craftsmen were pretty, pretty good at it. And uh, <clears throat> these only lasted about three or four years, and his factory closed. But it was his attempt to get into the European market. I didn't think I'd have so much capitalism in this talk, but. <laughs> But I mean, it, it's, it's how some of this stuff evolved. There are so many stories. It's almost like a, it's, it's like a tree, you know? It, it just grows and it gets bigger. And I suppose that's true of any uh, genre. But, uh, so why didn't they sell? Because the English copied them and made better ones. They made Tranter revolvers. They made uh, uh, a, a number of uh, patent revolvers. And they did sell, but not to the volume that he wanted. And A, they didn't need them. How many? They weren't fighting a war. They weren't fighting a war on their own soil, like we kind of had a conflict going for a long time. I mean, you, you got, you know, the Indian Wars after after the Civil War, and, and it was actually during the Civil War. Pretty, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, we we took their land and didn't like it, and uh, you know, we fought constantly, and so there was a conflict all through the West, and that kind of. I think that kind of stopped around 1880. I mean, people became successful. They made a lot of money. Theodore Roosevelt decided to be a little rancher. You know, it was uh, the good times. The, the tough times were over, and the good times were there. We have a couple of firearms from the good times from out west, and bad times from the Civil War, too. Uh, along with the uh, Henry Rifle um, the Spencer Company, uh, Daniel Spencer's firearm patent was uh, manufactured by Ambrose Burnside, who was a Civil War general, and had his own company for the Burnside rifle. Everybody competed during the Civil War, gotta make a gun, boom, get it out there. And so the Spencer was actually a very good gun, it just never went anywhere from, from where it was. Very well made, uh, made by the Burnside company, um, it loaded again, a repeater, and it loaded through the butt plate. And you remove the magazine like this, and you place the cartridges in here. 
flipped it up, and again, a lever action, which I'm not going to work. Just, just well, I guess I will. No, I'm not going. Um, a lever action, which uh, fed the cartridge in here into the barrel. It was a repeater, um, and it was a self-contained metallic cartridge. And it's, this one is a, an actually beautiful shape. It's almost new. It, it really is new. And um, it was a competitor with uh, Winchester, who was making, who, who evolved from Volcanic, who was making uh, the New Haven Arms. It wasn't the Winchester, it was New Haven Arms, made the Henry rifle. And Winchester bought it and made the 66 <coughs> rifle, which we'll get into here. Anybody like to look at this? This is heavy. Okay. okay. I'm on it. All right. This is good exercise. <laughs> it is. <laughs> this is my weight lifting for today. Yeah. You guys over there, look out, you don't slam. <laughs> 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 and I kind of rattling along here. If anybody uh, has any questions, feel free to. Yeah. Did Burnside make his own rifle? Like Correct. Right in Providence. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. So Burnside, in his own rifle factory, made his competitor's rifle. <laughs> and, but, you know, I mean, it's all capitalism. And, uh, and of course, Ambrose Burnside was a the usual uh, Civil War thing. He was actually a, a very prolific inventor. There were a number of other things that uh, he invented. <coughs> Not a very clever man, but uh, yeah, he made his competitor's rifle. So he collected twice, I guess. Yeah, one more question over here. Question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Actually, comment on the Spencer. Uh, during the Civil War, the Confederates called it the damn Yankee rifle. You could load on Sunday and shoot all week. Yes, that's right. It's kind of like the Indians say there was a gun on every finger. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. Yeah. And the Spencer was very, uh, it was very effective. But a lot of these things weren't brought out fast enough to be used fully during the Civil War, thank goodness, because it was bad enough. And uh, a lot of them uh, got used in the West as uh, used, you know, surplus weapons. Never, never issued them. Uh, the Indian Wars, <coughs> so-called, the Indian Wars in the West started about 18, well, they were going on, but they got pretty heavy around 1866, and they used, this This was a, a firearm they used quite a bit. Um, and I alluded to the connection between this volcanic pistol, and this is a gun which is a, called a 66 Winchester. It is um, no longer loaded with this clumsy, way of putting through here. It's just a port on the side. Port's pushed in, cartridge put in there, and they op operate the lever. And it same basic mechanism in here, a toggle, a hinge, which when bent pulls the breech back, when closed forms a straight line, and it resists the powder or the pressure of the gun. This is called a gun that won the West because it came out in 1866. And it was a period of uh, time when everybody had a firearm with them. And these were very heavily used and carried. This one's all marked up. Somebody's done some graffiti on here. I don't, it, uh, it says, it looks like it says Vivian, Vivian but misspelled. <laughs> you, can, you can check this out as this passed around. But anyway, this, this, is, this is the beginning of Winchester's very successful uh, manufacturing. And uh, this one has some, I don't know if it's graffiti or college fraternity or what. There's something on there. <laughs> yeah, do I don't know I, what it is. I, I call it Vivant or something like that, but I had to be careful with it. <laughs> sure. It's like D E V A N T. And Yeah, well, anyway, it, it's, it's been there and done yeah, that. Right. Yeah, right. Looks like there's also a uh, storage or something. In the yeah, the ramrod uh, to clean the bore was kept in the pre uh, uh, butts of a lot of these guns. <coughs> these are black powder. Black powder is very corrosive. So in the desert is, or the arid upper plains, um, that dries to a hard crust. And that will bring me up with one more thing. So you might operate that gun one day. If you're out on the trail and, and, and herding cattle or something, if you don't clean it, it will not operate the next day because there's a lot of moving parts. So they, on the early guns, they did keep ramrods with them, which brings me uh, to the last one, uh, which is a Sharps rifle. 
kind of an interesting sharp <coughs> rifle. <coughs> purportedly, I don't think we have any history with this, but purportedly it was a gift it's from uh, William F. Cody here. to somebody else. Um, it's certainly uh, worthy of that. So this is a customized Sharps rifle, and the company was called Freund Brothers, F-R-E-U-N-D. And uh, this was something that a wealthy rancher or a gold miner who struck it rich, or somebody who was a person of means traveling the West or in the West would have made for him. It is all engraved and it has a whole pile of patented um, sites. This is a patent site. It's called a Seymour site, U.S. patent. The breaching is all changed from the sharps. It's a, a breach which, because black powder dried so hard, this type of gun could not be opened because the breach just slid down. So if it were shot, <coughs> you could open it, but you couldn't get another cartridge in. So this guy decided to, to push the cartridge in. So as the breech comes up, it grabs the back of the cartridge and shoves it in with force. Uh, that was one of the uh, downfalls of the Sharps rifles that they used for buffalo hunting. And this guy, uh, <coughs> Freud Brothers or George Freud, made a living following the buffalo hunters and making these rifles. He started in St. Louis, he went to <coughs> Cheyenne, he went to Denver, and he went to Durango. In each place he had a big custom shop. It was quite a large to do. And this is really one of the finest uh, specimens that if you look as it's passed around, you'll see his Freund brothers and then these tiny stampings all along the top of the barrel. They're all his patented and, and everything. And so he has completely redone this. And this is, would be um, a wealthy rancher. This is not, this is an expensive rifle. And uh, oh, it's also called the American frontier. So even in 1875 or 78, they were kind of worshiping themselves. They were already on TV, but you know, it, it was everybody wanted to be a cowboy. And uh, I call it the cowboy renaissance. It really, cowboy in the real West was over in 1875, but they wouldn't let it go. It was just too romantic. And they kept it going right through into the silent movies. Uh, and there were guys who claimed to be cowboys like Tom Hicks and, and others who just went right into the movies. But the real times were over. These guys were running around with guys like Theodore Roosevelt and, and uh, what you'd call a gentleman farmer. And they would be gentleman cowboys. And they're the ones that you saw with the big, mm. the big chaps and this sort of all dressed up. <clears throat> Those guys could have gotten into uh, having a thing like that. I call it cowboy renaissance. It's just. The, the, the hard times were over. But anyway, it's the last piece that I have that I thought was interesting. A custom gun from. Did you mention Buffalo Bill? I did. Okay, but, all right. But I said it's un. Okay. Un, un, it's, it's unprovenized, but very likely. Buffalo Bill supposedly presented this, and I've done a number of uh, vetting of firearms, and that's one of the finest uh, uh, of that type I've ever seen. So the caliber still looks like it's all over the place. So how would, yeah, what would they do for ammunition? I mean, you could, are they still making their own? Uh, this, this is a manufactured cartridge. This is a manufactured cartridge. And this. And everything else is either you bought a paper cartridge from a purveyor that was made by Colt, and you put it in, and when you When you apply the loading lever, it crushed the paper cartridge up into the chamber. It pushed the ball down like a swage. And then you turned it this way, and you put a cap on the tube. And you rotate it slowly until every tube or nipple was it had a cap on it. These are the uh, projectiles. I think you probably saw them. <coughs> you, had, you had your choice of a projectile. So this is really making it yourself. This is making it your own. And this is a complete kit. That's the, uh, the projectile. This is a conical bullet. They had round bullets for the same thing. 
These guys, this is a completely a manufactured. These have to be <coughs> self-contained metallic packages. Mm -hmm. well, this is a real do-it-yourself operation down here. If all of the muzzle loaders are just as I told you. Dan? Yeah. What's the relation of sharps to Freud brothers? I mean, did they do that by <coughs> license or is uh, there was sharps a, is there, there, there was a license yeah. and uh, they tried to uh, negotiate with sharps to have sharps yeah. bring out their improvements on the sharps <coughs> guns, but uh, he wanted too much of a royalty, and there's a whole bunch of dialogue back and forth. But they were very clever uh, gentlemen, and they fit a, a period of time when people wanted a very um, customized and special object among men who would, as I say, gentlemen cowboys. I'm sorry, but it, it's, you know, I, I, mean, I think they were tough, and I think they had their fights, but I think they were. You know. Yes? What's the effective range of the shark? Um, that sharps, uh, the sharps, uh, well, you know, you've all heard the story of Billy Dixon who shot uh, uh, the Battle of Big Wells, shot an Indian off his horse at one mile, which was, that is way beyond. The person had to aim in the sky at the moon <laughs> to do this, but he was experienced enough to possibly have done it. I think the effective range of buffalo hunting is up to 600 yards, and they would much rather it be three or 400 yards. Um, and there are marksmen, and they had to make their own ammunition to do that, that could do it. But the sharps is, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's effective. It will kill at a great range, but whether you can actually obtain accuracy with a sight picture is a question. But the, uh, the buffalo sharps, uh, which we don't have one here. They had uh, sophisticated sights, aperture sights at the rear, uh, sights at the front that were shaded with a very fine bead on it, and a good eye, a young man, and uh, a lot of experience could well probably hit something at 600 yards. Probably, certainly the size of a buffalo. I, I would say most certainly. Uh, something this size mm, 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 might be. And I have shot those, and I have shot them at two and three hundred yards, including the percussion uh, types that were in the Civil War. There were some that were had a paper cartridge. Anybody else? Yep. Um, I have a sharps that I shoot, a modern day sharps. Yep. Forty eighty two caliber. Oh yeah. And I've been to the Quigley matches in Montana. Oh yeah, good for uh, you. Yeah, eight hundred yards. Yeah. And yeah. Hit about half the time. Yeah, a little better. Yeah, the target is about those size. Yeah, yeah. So I'm somewhere in the range of saying 600 yards 600 is, is practical. Yeah. Is practical. Exactly. We today, if somebody goes hunting and they say, "I want to shoot this thing," at, uh, if they want to go hunting, uh, the, the, it's improper to do it at a great range um, because you're more likely to wound the animal. If you are a conservationist on hunter and you want to do that, you know, there's a responsibility. So most guys will not let a guided hunt shoot over two or three hundred yards. There are guys that can do it, but uh, it's uh, hard to prove. Uh, the biggest problem on the prairie is wind. Yeah. So. <laughs> and the mirage, if it's... Uh, and mirage. <coughs> if, it's, if you have a lot of heat. Yeah. yeah exactly. I've, uh, <laughs> years ago, I went to Camp Perry and shot uh, military matches there. No hero about it, but uh, we would shoot at a thousand yards. And if you looked with a telescope, at the person in front of you shooting, he was lying down, he'd take an aim with a high-powered rifle, and he would wait, and he'd shoot. And when you looked in the telescope, you would see a mirage of a V. It was very faint, and it would rise up like this. It would go way over there, and then it would come down, and it would hit. And it was all the wind. It would go 14 feet in the air, and 9 feet to the left. And you could see it as a diffraction mirage in the telescope, especially if you unfocused the telescope. So you, instead of looking at the target really clearly, you slightly unfocused it, this mirage became, it was a trick that people used to tell a guy how to move his sights. <laughs> anyway, there's lots of interesting things like that. Does anybody have any uh, other questions or anything, I don't know what time it is, but anything that we haven't, uh, you'd like to see that we, might have on the archives, or you have something you need? I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, not, it's not about me, but 
Um, you get to see that. That'll be in the end, right? All right. You want me to get it out? Oh, you can get it. Sure. I'll get it. Sure, it's my okay. Dan, what was, what was the most advanced thing that Lily had in his? The most uh, modern? Yeah. He, he, as I say, there are over uh, 14 Kentucky Rifles, and he seemed to be concentrating on American history and, and, and kind of our heritage, you know, quote unquote, the Heritage Museum. He didn't get in, I, I think there were some World War I uh, infields. I think some of those were donated after his collection, but I, I think Jennifer could answer that best. Well, she stayed in the 19th century. Yeah. 19th century, yeah. And uh, mostly early, and there's a large number of uh, pistols, some of which are upstairs, uh, interesting, uh, I call them curiosa, the little curious guns with daggers in the middle of them and stuff like that, but um, they're all interesting. And I think what most people <coughs> see when they see firearms and they talk about them are points of history. I think it's not so much what this thing can do or what it did to people. It's kind of like that was there. This is a reminder of that period of time. And, uh, you know, it's kind of hard not to remember wars and conflict. It's, uh, you know, so I think a lot of, uh, at least my interest in it is where it was, what it did, what the people might have been like around it when they used or were in that interest. <coughs> Um, we have uh, Jennifer. Can we have anybody have any interest in anything else? Uh, other types of firearms. There's about 150 in the collection, and we pulled out some of the interesting ones. Yes. Wheel locks. Wheel locks. Yes, we do. Yes. I believe there's. Yep, there's a couple. Yeah. You've been here before, though. <laughs> <laughs> you have superior knowledge. Many years ago. <laughs> yeah. What about the hockey rifle? A good point, and I don't think there's a good example of that, but I'm going to ask Jennifer about that. Hawk and Rifle was really an offspring of a Kentucky, as, you, as I kind of said. So they got out of the plains, and they found that these guns were carried across the pommel of a horse, which many of the guns in Kentucky's would have a big wear mark in here, worn right down to the ramrod, where they were balanced. And they were too long. <laughs> And they were dropping them, and they were breaking them in half. So they made a much shorter and much heavier caliber um, uh, full stock rifle, and it was called a Hawken rifle because it was made by uh, Hawken in uh, St. Louis. Uh, <laughs> St. Louis. Um, he was a maker, and it was a, a specialized rifle for the plains use. And Jason, look and look at this. Yeah. Want to come on and take a look? This is uh, like the most ostentatious, but kind of interesting. <laughs> this is a rifle I made, I think, in 1970, maybe 76. There, it says 76. I guess that's when I made it. <laughs> um, so I made this for the uh, director of uh, the museum, one of the directors. So this was a special commission from J.K. Lilly III to the first director of Heritage, Nelson Price, who was leaving his position in 1976. So he's the person who really oversaw all the construction of the buildings and the start of the museum, got everything going, and then left it retired in 1976. So Mr. Lilly asked uh, Dan to make him this firearm. This reminds me, I had somebody working for me once. And now his words are coming true. Um, I was supervised. I had two or three people working for me in the restoration shop. And uh, I showed somebody a picture of something I had done formerly like this. And he goes, yeah. He says, he's showing you how good he used to be. Uh. <laughs> and I guess that's what I'm showing you. So anyway, this is a Kentucky rifle that I made. You can see I, I kind of like them. Um, this is a, yeah, it's 76 in the gold inlay, a gold wine pan, all silver furniture. Uh, such guns as this did exist. We don't have any, but they were bought and purchased by wealthy planters. Uh, and uh, I think, oh, and it's got the ubiquitous 
gold arrow so you cannot miss? Point <laughs> <laughs> it this way, right? Yeah, point it that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can't miss. Oh, yes, an important point that this man is pointing out is that when Nelson Price died, his widow gave the firearm to Harry. Right. Yes. Very nice. Yeah. The, the blue hammer. Yeah. Which blue. the DM. Ah, it's just a little. Um, <laughs> I, you're bragging. I guess it's my you know, <laughs> feminine side coming out. I don't know. Um, it's it's a brilliant fire blow. Yeah, it's How a little. That oh, it's it's done in a fire. Yeah. I thought you meant it was a little. It is a little. It's very show. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> it's good. Right, gotcha. But uh, it's um, it's done in a in a fire and a flame, and uh, the steel turns different colors. They start out with a very faint. Um, we call it a faint yellow, and then it goes into a yellow brown, then a yellow brown purple, and then at 570 degrees, which you don't measure, you simply hold it there in a pair of tongs and move it around in the fire until mm. it's right, and you put it in water. <laughs> and there it is forever. So all these pieces that are bright with screws, uh, they're all uh, done in that manner. And uh, so I, I inlaid uh, a blue steel fleur de lis. Mm -hmm. I did a pretty good American Eagle there. Some hearts. All of these designs are taken from uh, things that are found on Kentucky's, including these lace work patch boxes. And there were such firearms as these. Mm. But I would say if I made one today, I probably would tone it down a little. <laughs> <laughs> but I was trying to show off. Why would you tone it down? Well, well I guess it's. Kick it's, it up a notch. Yeah, I guess it's the conservative of, <laughs> conservatism of age anyway. How long did it take you to make that? Oh, don't ask that. <laughs> How many times did you have to make No, no, one time. <laughs> one time. Uh, one time. Uh, yeah. okay. is, I think it's a 45. I'm what quite the, sure. What are the stars represent? Uh, I think it was 70. See, this was uh, 1976. Oh, so I think I. Is there 13? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> uh, maybe I've got to count. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's what I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the eleventh state, I guess. <laughs> anyway, uh, we ran out of stock. <laughs> all this, all, all of this uh, furniture I made by hand. Wow. I didn't cast it. It's all uh, made of bent silver and, and hammered up, and then I engraved it all. And it's got some. It's it actually has looked nice with age, I think. Wow. So it's. Uh, yeah. This is all the. Uh, Sort of engraving you should do. <laughs> this, this wasn't supposed to be about me. You got me to. I wouldn't have done this. I would have never seen it. No, you would never see it. And you would never see it again either. I do all. Where did you get the curly maple? I got it from Slippery Rock. Uh, three, three old gentlemen down there who would cruise the woods that they owned with a chainsaw and go, I think that tree's got curly in it. And they'd cut it down and mill it up and they would sell it. They were purveyors of uh, curly maple. And I have a beautiful table in my home, which was from the piece of wood that this came from. Uh, so anyway, anybody else want to? Old mill that you had that's right. moved. So, still use it? Yes. 
Oh yeah, I'm yeah. out there every day. Where, where, where did that meal come from? It came from Ham. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Which part do you want? The yeah. you and the or gun. Okay, well, <laughs> more than um, better, better. So yeah. get on here and then. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of the detail that they put into it, and it is detail that it is difficult to do. A lot of hours bending over, that's why I walk like this. Anyway, cool. Gave his money's worth. Oh, yeah. But I got my money's worth out of it, too, in the sense that I enjoyed making it a great deal. You know, it's just, it was great. Um, and I've made a number of these, actually. Quite a number. So, thank you all for that. So, if anyone would like the opportunity to see in our storage space where we keep the rest of our long arms, and also we have a cabinet over here where we keep some of our short arms, I'm happy to show you those things. Yeah, I take a peek. Okay. I take a peek. Mm -hmm. and if you see something, you have a question, Jennifer or I probably know the answer. Not me. You. I was going to do the ventriloquist thing. <laughs>